Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the Tory Botanical Society's Tory Talks lecture series. My name is Catherine Mercier. I'm the Society Programming Chair. The Tory Botanical Society was founded in 1867 and is an organization for all people interested in plant life, including professional and amateur botanists, students, and others who simply enjoy nature. Today, the objectives of the Society are to promote interest in botany and to collect and disseminate information on all phases of plant science. These objectives are fulfilled through meetings, field trips, public lectures, publications, fundings of graduate research and education, and sponsorship of symposia and regional conferences. The best way to step, stay updated on future lectures and all our other events um, is to become a member, which you can find out more about on our website, toriabotanical.org. And you can also follow us on social media, the handles of which are all on this slide. I'll also mention very quickly our upcoming field trip this weekend with Dr. Harvey Ballard, where we're going to go to Van Cortland Park um, and hopefully see some violets, talk about some violets. Um, and you can check out our website for more upcoming uh, field trips. Uh, this is our last lecture for the season, for the spring season. Um, and our series will restart in September. But in the meantime, we are running a survey to get everybody's interest in different topics and themes for the lecture series for the future. Um, and we're also taking in the survey suggestions for future speakers, which you can do through the survey, or you can always reach out to me. My contact information is on the Toy Botanical uh, website. Sorry if you can hear my dog barking in the background. He's very <laughs> excited to be here. <laughs> um, the link to the survey is up on the screen, but I'll also post it in the chat in just a moment so you can just copy and paste uh, the link. And our members will also receive the survey link in an email. Uh, the survey is also only gonna be active for about two weeks. So make sure to get it completed sooner rather than later if you would like to provide input. Um, before we begin the talk, just a few quick notes about Zoom. Please do keep yourself muted, so turn your sound off, but you're free to have your camera on or off during the talk. You are welcome to enter comments and questions in the chat as we go. Um, when we reach the Q&A portion, please use the raise hand feature of Zoom um, if you'd like to ask a question and I'll um, ask you to unmute. Or if you would like, you can also put your question in the chat and I will read that out. If you would like to share the talk with someone else or maybe watch it again in the future, it will be recorded and available on our YouTube page uh, shortly. Tonight's talk will be presented by Dr. Harvey Ballard, who is currently a professor at Ohio University, but has been studying violets since high school during their academic career, they expanded their research to the violet relationships in the family worldwide, but has recently been focused on Eastern North American violets. In the recent monograph in the Journal of the Torrey Botanical Society, Harvey and their co-authors summarize what we know and don't know taxonomically about violets in Northeastern North America. And this monograph is open access and available on Bio One. Plus, we are updating the website, so soon you'll be able to purchase a physical copy of the monograph, if you like. Um, and I expect we'll get a sneak peek or a peek, not a sneak peek, just a peek into the monograph sort of topics tonight during the talk. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Harvey. Thank you. This is where we seamlessly do the uh, transition. Transition, the handoff. <laughs> <laughs> Should I give it a shot? Yes. All right. Can you see it? 
looks great. Okay. All right. Ho I'll hopefully my face isn't in there so that you can just see the whole slide program. We can. We can. Okay. Excellent. Well, right. thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I'm going to uh, probably give you more than you really ever wanted to know, and I'm still just scratching the surface uh, on violence of Northeastern North America, and also the bigger picture where, where they originated, uh, about uh, a little bit about violent biology and how that impacts taxonomy, uh, how we kind of came a few, uh, a, probably well, a decade ago, I guess now, to a, a new uh, reappreciation of the taxonomic limits of violets in uh, Eastern North America. And I, I specifically included my colleagues, John Cartes and Masako Nishino on this presentation because they were on the monograph and, and it really wouldn't have been possible without their incredible help and, uh, and, uh, and support. So I just wanted to acknowledge them as, as being a part of this presentation, even though they're obviously not giving it. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, so uh, the violet family as a whole, up until a couple of decades ago, had uh, 22 genera and around up to 1,100 species. Uh, and the taxonomy was a fairly straightforward one, uh, classification-wise. Uh, there were three subfamilies, and the largest by far, the Violoidae, was divided into two main tribes, uh, the Rhinorii, uh, Rhinorii ee, -E, uh, which has uh, actinomorphic or radially, or radially symmetrical flowers and without a spur and without nectaries, and then the viola e uh, with bilaterally symmetrical or zygomorphic flowers and generally speaking, floral spurs and nectaries. Uh, I, uh, I and my uh, graduate students and colleagues uh, conducted a phylogenetic study in 2014 or published one uh, and uh, a pretty extensive sampling of the family. Uh, and we discovered, maybe not surprising, that the, uh, the origin of zygomorphic or bilaterally symmetrical flowers arose multiple times. I think we six to 10 times from different radially symmetrical ancestors. And the classification that was based on that was not supported at all. Uh, became more complicated. Uh, and it also turned out that at least Viola was, was uh, well supported as, as a monophyletic or natural evolutionary lineage, but the second and third largest genera, Hybanthus and Rhinoria, were not. Uh, in fact, they, you can see they, they uh, were peppered all over the uh, phylogenetic background. Um, so we re-examined traits uh, that defined previous genera, uh, and we discovered that uh, a few didn't look at floral symmetry as a main device, uh, divisive feature, that there were lots of other traits, including anatomical ones that supported the relationships. Uh, we resurrected four genera, uh, old names that had been described many years back, and we described three new ones. Uh, so we have 29 genera so far, and we're in the process of describing uh, four of the five additional genera now. Uh, we hope by the end of the year, we'll be submitting manuscripts on those. And so in North America, what we have is viola, which everybody knew. Uh, Hybanthus concolor is now Cubelium concolor uh, as a single gene, single species genus. And then uh, the rest of the Latin American, most of the rest of the Latin American hybanthoids are now in the genus Pombalia. Okay, um, uh, my colleague, uh, Thomas Markison in Europe and a number of other uh, researchers there uh, used a number of single copy nuclear genes uh, to examine viola more specifically and discovered lots and lots of allopolyploidy, uh, lots of ancient violet sex and uh, chromosome duplications, ge genomic duplications, uh, so much so that, uh, that there were many uh, allopolyploid lineages. In fact, the only diploid lineages they found in the genus Viola were two South American lineages and then one Northern Hemisphere lineage. And when he uh, used the same phylogenetic approach and investigated uh, North American lineages, Hawaiian and Mexican and Central American lineages, uh, they found uh, the similar story, much uh, allopolyploidization, uh, uh, more allopolyploidization events than they knew about at the broader level within uh, the smaller lineages in, in this region. Uh, and the only diploid lineage was confirmed 
to be suction cavity millennium. So our yellow uh, or white and yellow flowered violets uh, in the Northern hemisphere. And everything else is allopolyploid, which is interesting. Um, so, and we're talking about a lot of larger and smaller lineages uh, around the Northern hemisphere and elsewhere. Uh, in uh, in the, the lineages they studied, there were five that originated from an allodecoploid ancestor. This is an, an ancestor with five distinct nuclear, uh, diploid nuclear genomes. That includes the Hawaiian uh, nospiniums, most of which are woody and tree-like, uh, the Arctic Langsdorfiani, uh, and the Mexican and Central American subsection Mexicani. Uh, and some of those actually evolved from additional allopolyploidization events beyond the, the 10x ancestor. Uh, Markison and, and I and a number of other uh, uh, violet specialist colleagues uh, have worked for the last few years and finally published a, a new phylogenetic classification of the genus Viola worldwide, uh, which I'm very proud of. I feel like I um, was lucky to have that as a as a, a a career milestone without having, you know, gone into retirement to do it. Uh, and uh, we uh, described uh, quite a lot of lineages uh, and uh, some for the first time, and then accepted 664 species in the genus Viola, which puts it as one of the 50 largest genera of angiosperms. I'm gonna take a detour here and talk a little bit about reproductive biology, just because it's so cool in violets. Uh, and. Uh, and we'll just jump right in. Andrew Beatty in, in the 1970s uh, worked with uh, other colleagues and described the pollination biology and the seed dispersal strategies of violets, first in European violets and then over here in North America. Uh, and, it, uh, and the reproductive biology has continued to be maintained as far as we can tell uh, from his original uh, models. So we're looking at the interior of a, of a, a cutaway of a flower and uh, ho hopefully you can see my cursor. So we have the pistil with a long style and the stigma at the tip. We have a cone of stamens and at the tips of the stamens are what we call connective appendages. They're uh, elastic orange scales uh, and they, they uh, they and the conostamens uh, uh, are tightly surrounding the middle of the style uh, and the, the pollen sacs release the pollen into that cone uh, and the pollen is kept inside the cone because of those connective appendages. So what happens is an insect, a pollinator, sticks its head into the flower uh, and with the top of its head pushes the style upward. Now the style is on a, at the very base has an, a little elastic hinge right there. Uh, and as it's shoving its head into the style, uh, a droplet oozes out uh, and, it, and the insect scrapes pollen from a previous flower onto that droplet. Simultaneously as that style is lifted, the pollen, uh, there's a gap formed and the pollen from the current flower falls onto the head or the neck of the insect. When the, uh, the insect removes its head, um, the pollen from the current flower covers the old pollen from a previous flower. And as the style snaps back into position, that droplet is sucked into the stigma along with the newest pollen grains and that affects pollination. Uh, as far as seed dispersal goes, uh, in, in viola, there are two relatively distinct uh, dispersal strategies. One is called myrmecockery. Uh, this is only found in, in uh, a few European species in, this, uh, in the section viola, uh, including viola odorata, which is introduced in our areas. And so in the myrmecockerous forms, uh, the capsules are on prostrate stalks and the capsules disintegrate uh, and spill the seeds out at the bottom, uh, right, uh, right at the base of the maternal, the mother plant. Uh, in diplockery, the capsules get elevated onto stalks uh, 
this is true in stemmed ones, obviously, but also in the stemless ones, uh, and, and all of our North American species are diplocris, those capsules split open naturally, and the sides of the three valves squeeze together as they dry and shoot the seeds uh, one, uh, one to three meters uh, away. I've actually had um, violets in bags on my desk in the office uh, once in a while and I've come in uh, uh, later and I've heard the little ping, ping, ping of seeds that are shooting all over my office. Uh, so uh, the, the ejection or explosive ballistic mechanism of diplocary shoots the seed some distance away from the mother plant. Uh, and then uh, in both cases, ants find the fat bodies or eliosomes on the seeds. They're attracted to those. They'll eat the eliosomes and then often dump the seeds near the entrance of the nest, which has a lot of good uh, uh, nitrogenous material to uh, promote growth of the violet. Uh, the violets, uh, nearly, nearly all of the genus Viola has a mixed breeding system. So you're familiar with the showy uh, cross-pollinating flowers. Those are the pretty, pretty ones. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of violas also produce cleistogamous flowers. These are, these are self-pollinating flowers which mechanically uh, cannot open. And so they immediately self-pollinate almost as soon as they're developed. Uh, the idea uh, from an evolutionary standpoint is that the cosmogamous seeds will have higher genetic diversity because they're cross-pollinated with other less closely related individuals. Uh, and that's good if your environment uh, is fluctuating. Uh, and the self-pollinating flowers, the cleistogamous flowers, produce seeds which are, are more genetically similar to each other and to the maternal or mother plant. Uh, which would be ideal for growing conditions that uh, uh, are in the immediate vicinity of where they originated. Uh, in northern latitudes, chasmogamous flowers and, and violets usually are produced before the spring uh, forest canopy leaves out fully uh, and when pollinators are still active. Once the forest canopy closes, pollinators uh, are relatively inactive and that's when the cleistogamous flowers develop. Uh, when you go further south, wh where growing conditions are better most of the year and there's not a period of dormancy, you'll find chasmogamous and cleistogamous flowers overlapping in, in their phenology. Uh, the cleistogamous flower is underdeveloped, and uh, I've had a long-term project with a molecular biologist colleague of mine, Sarah Wyatt, and we've shared students looking at the genetic basis of this mixed breeding system. Uh, the, the sepals look mostly normal, but the petals uh, are absent or rudimentary. The stamens have, uh, uh, have a few pollen grains are rudimentary themselves. And the style actually curls in on itself and in many cases appears to burrow into the stamens, uh, into the anther sacs and self-pollinates that way. Uh, we've, we've done uh, uh, studies on the genetic basis looking at the ABC model floral genes uh, and have found uh, essentially perfect correspondence uh, to whether the B-class genes are uh, fully active and producing uh, normal flowers or whether the B-class genes uh, get almost bypassed and there are no petals and rudimentary stamens are produced. Uh, now, the Chasmogamous and cleistogamous seeds, as far as we've been able to tell, are identical, but the capsules can be very different. Uh, and on the same plant, the chasmogamous capsules from the showy cross-pollinating flowers will often be uh, green on upright peduncles because they're simply the fertilized uh, chasmogamous flowers, whereas the cleistogamous capsules uh, can be on prostrate peduncles or even buried into the ground somewhat, uh, and the capsules may be heavily spotted. Um, uh, a bit about hybridization. Uh, when I first started studying violets long ago, I, I learned pretty quickly that uh, they were notorious for hybridization. Uh, and it's true that uh, the bulk of the, of the groups around the world do hybridize, some more than others. Uh, and what's interesting is while viola uh, expresses a great deal of hybridization, uh, hybridization in the rest of the violet family is almost unheard of. It's very peculiar. Uh, 
given that it's uh, that viola ha shows uh, such extensive allopolyploidy, it certainly must have happened early in the evolution of the group too. Uh, Interlineage hybridization is is very rare. Uh, at least in North American violets. There are only two examples uh, from, uh, I believe, one site each uh, where a stemless white and a stemless blue violet hybridized. And those, uh, those populations after they were pressed gradually died out and were never seen again. So interlineage hybridization practically never happens and you might as well dismiss it. Uh, Interspecific hybridization, though, especially within the younger lineages, is frequent to common. So you have to be prepared if you're wanting to go out to identify plants. Uh, the good news is uh, that, and I'll mention this uh, in a bit, uh, the vast majority of hybrids are sterile, except for those in one group, the acolescent blue violets. Uh, so if you find a hybrid uh, and it doesn't produce seeds, that, or you find an odd plant that doesn't produce seeds, then you can be pretty well convinced that you're looking at a hybrid. Uh, Ezra Brainerd was really one of the first to document hybridization as, as being a, a common phenomenon in viola in North America. He published a series of papers and was uh, really a phenomenal taxonomist and, uh, and uh, added greatly to our knowledge of viola hybrids. He published uh, a, uh, a tome in 1924 that summarized all of his research uh, and in documenting 80 hybrids, and we've uh, documented 29 more to add to it. Uh, I'm gonna uh, highlight a little bit more on what uh, Brainerd found. Uh, he, he documented that in other groups besides the acolescent blues, so I'm talking about the rostrate violets and the acolescent stemless uh, or stemless whites, um, uh, he found that they were essentially always sterile. F1s were uh, even potentially frequent, but the but they never produced viable seed, and sometimes even the capsules aborted. But in the acolescent blues, and this is where he was famous, and this is where most of us lost the 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 the, the, the important uh, note from his research uh, initially. Most of them are subfertile, which means that they produce at least a a few viable seed. They don't produce, they don't reproduce by chasmogamous flowers. The hybrids don't produce chasmogamous seeds. They only reproduce by self-pollinating cleistogamous flowers. Um, the subfertile hybrids will produce a lower percentage of seeds relative to the parents. This is easily quantified. Uh, we've looked at a number of hybrids and confirmed Brainerd's findings. And what's more, what's really bizarre is that the, the F1 and F2 and F3 hybrid generations will generate progeny that show Mendelian segregation of traits between the parental species. Uh, and he continued to find segregation into the F4 generation. Um, presumably at some point that would stop. Uh, but uh, he was never able to carry it uh, far enough to document it. At any rate, what this means is if you find a weird plant in the acolescent blue violets and you suspect it's a hybrid, wait until it produces mature cleistogamous fruits, open the capsule, and you will find uh, Mendelian segregation of the seed traits of the parental species. And in the acolescent blues, nearly every species has a diagnostic color pattern and size for the seeds. Okay, enough about that for the moment. Uh, in terms of species concepts and taxonomic delimitation, um, uh, I wanted to uh, just touch base on that because I feel like it's important for us to mention species concepts and how we're delineating taxa. So there are a lot of them that have been just, uh, debated over the last century. Common ones uh, you may have heard are morphological and biological and phylogenetic, the genetic cohesion uh, concept, the ecological concept, an evolutionary concept. And depending on the group, uh, you might get a different answer uh, 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 determined by the actual species concept or data that you use. So when Kevin DeCuros wrote a series of papers ending with a a really elegant one in his 2007 uh, species concept publication. And he argued for a different perspective. Uh, when he looked at all of the different concepts, he noticed that they seemed to follow a theme, that they generally accepted an evolutionary species uh, that involves populations interacting through gene flow in some way. And then he proposed that uh, 
the species concepts could make be made simpler by having a unified proposal. And his proposal was that a species was a separately evolving metapopulation. Metapopulation meaning a set of populations interconnected by real or potential gene flow. And that the previous species concepts should be considered as lines of evidence to evaluate that at criterion with any set of populations. And he also argued that any evidence supporting uh, that species uh, would be sufficient, but the more lines of evidence are better. Uh, and then under this, you could imagine that some uh, subspecies or varieties would probably be distinct species under the USC. Uh, and there have been a number of other broader uh, theoretical species concepts proposed since then. Um, but uh, uh, we've actually studied this and, and uh, determined that it applies very well in the, in the violet family. So uh, those of you who knew anything about my previous work before 2012 uh, probably had figured out or might have uh, realized that I, I was mostly following Norman Russell's delimitation of broad species, uh, some of which might be quite variable. Um, and, uh, and his survey was very useful. Um, and, and then in 2012, I had a series of epiphanies. One of them uh, was brought about when I visited the mountains of Virginia. I got a chance to go to the Mountain Lake Biological Station and stay for three weeks during the early spring through late summer. And I made contact with botanists there, uh, Tom Weebolt and Johnny Townsend, and asked if they might have some time to take me around to different habitats so that we could look for violets. So they did. Uh, and then I was uh, somewhat humiliated when I realized that half of the violets that we were hunting and uh, encountered, I really couldn't put a name on where they didn't look quite right. Uh, they just weren't the same as the violets up here in the north. And, I, uh, and they didn't match any of the violet treatments that had been published for Eastern North America at the time. Um, so that spurred me to really study uh, Ezra Brainerd's and other violet specialists work again. I'd done it uh, many years before and intermittently since, but I read Brainerd's papers more in intensively. And I finally caught on to what he was describing and documenting. He was finding reproductive isolation among the stemless blues and among other stemless violet lineages and the stemmed violet lineages. Uh, and his species uh, were based on that. Uh, and although people have cited Brainerd as uh, one of the key proponents of hybridization in viola, there is nowhere in the literature before 2012 where people acknowledge these other important evolutionary findings. So I took that to heart. I also uh, read Nir Gilad's excellent work on the stemless blues where he uh, showed uh, that uh, not only were, were Brainerd's um, proposals of Pleistogamous capsule and seed traits very important. So there's a wealth of additional traits in the fruits and seeds that practically nobody since Brainerd had used before. Uh, and he also, showed that there are micromorphological features in the lateral petal hairs and on the seed coats. Uh, and he showed that using electron microscopy. So we switched our tactics. Uh, we have borrowed approaches from other specialists that seem to give uh, novel insights. Uh, so we have a, an Ezra Brainerd Memorial Violet Garden, and we uh, bring multiple plants from populations that we're studying. We grow them into the, in the garden, uh, sometimes over multiple years. And we, uh, uh, we are able to observe spring morphology, summer morphology. We can observe reproductive behavior. We, uh, for potential hybrids, we can examine the, uh, the uh, seeds of the Cleistogamous capsules and sometimes even infer the parental species. Um, we, uh, we use scanning electron microscopy to look at the lateral petal hairs and the seeds in, in some of the groups. Uh, we take soil cores and we analyze soil factors to examine microhabitat differences. And it turns out that every taxon that we believe is morphologically different from others also occupies a unique microhabitat separate from those other violets. And then in a few cases, we've been able to get money to use microsatellite markers that we've isolated. So 
we've used what we call a modified unified species concept uh, in that species are separately evolved metapopulations. They have to exhibit at least some phenotypic differentiation. And we evaluate all of our available lines of evidence uh, to detect and to delineate the species. Uh, so some of the some of the conclusions that we've come up with uh, since that 2012, it, won't, it wasn't a debacle, I guess you could say, it was a fortuitous opportunity, uh, trying to force fit Southern violets into Northern violet concepts probably doesn't always work. Um, the, the, uh, all of the violet specialists have been uh, primarily Northeastern uh, and, uh, and we've attempted to force fit Southern violets into those concepts. There's a lot more violet diversity out there. Our intensive field work and our, our new uh, integrative taxonomic work has shown that there's a lot more diversity than previous taxonomies have reflected or allowed. Uh, there are, uh, are many more distinct evolutionary species that we need to accept. Brainerd species have all held up, every single one of them, uh, and he didn't go far enough. Uh, and so you'll see quite a bit more, quite a few more species uh, in our new violet monograph because of that. And then there are several vi variants. There are at least a dozen variants uh, that we've been studying in Eastern North America that don't quite fit the taxa, even as we've delimited them newly, uh, and they may be additional species. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on, on the diversity of North American violets and, and uh, those in our region uh, in a broad sense. So this is a, a, a hot a heat map, I guess you could say, at a county level showing violet diversity. And what you'll be able to see instantly, uh, the darker green being the highest diversity, is that the Appalachian Mountains and Great Lakes region uh, shows quite a lot of diversity, higher than most. The Atlantic Piedmont, Ozark Mountains, and the Mississippian Bayment in the east uh, show uh, uh, next highest diversity. And then generally speaking, the Pacific coastal states and the Rocky Mountains uh, show some uh, diversity. So these are the main hot spots for violet diversity in North America. Uh, as far as uh, distribution goes, there are only three truly transcontinental species, uh, Viola edunca, Viola nephrophila, and Viola renifolia. All the rest, have more regional distributions, although they may be quite broad. Uh, what I also have found interesting in looking at North American violets is that almost all the Great Plains species uh, are shared with Eastern North America, but there are very, very few species that are shared between Eastern and Western North America, meaning that they probably generally have a somewhat separate evolutionary history. Uh, this is the region that we delineated for our, our violet monograph, and it follows exactly Rob Noxie's uh, regional dele delineation for his new manual. Uh, and in fact, uh, the monograph is the forerunner for the, the condensed treatment that we'll be presenting to Rob uh, in the imminent future. Rob, I know you're listening in. Um, the, there are uh, a number of violet uh, taxa that are restricted to the Northeast region as we've defined it. Uh, Viola Baxteri, and I'm just going to use Latin names, I'm sorry, sometimes I even forget the common names, I hope you'll forgive me, uh, but you can look them up later. Uh, Viola Baxteri is a regional endemic, Viola Egglestonii Canadian variant uh, is, is found only in Ontario so far. Uh, Viola Latiuscula Novi Anglii, uh, one variant of the Palmeta complex. Uh, one subspecies of Pedeta that we described uh, in the mine uh, or uh, elevated uh, to subspecies rank in the monograph. And then uh, one species that we described in the monograph. Um, uh, it's a two county endemic in Virginia. Uh, there are 10 native species that are widely distributed. Uh, Cubilium, uh, the green violet, uh, the sand violet, Viola aphnus, Viola cuculata. You can read all those. Uh, and then 49, so these are the species which have wide distributions in Eastern North America. And then 49 others have much more restricted distribution. So again, uh, when we recognize broad, broadly delimited species, of course, most of them were all over the place. But when we began to uh, set our sights lower and recognize more taxonomic diversity, the majority of those have narrow geographic distributions. 
here's the upshot of our taxonomic work at the moment uh, compared to previous taxonomic treatments. Uh, right now, uh, in just for uh, the violas, we recognize uh, uh, 79 species. Uh, that includes uh, infras or 79 taxa, I should say. That includes uh, native species, native uh, infraspecific taxa or variants, and also introduced species. Uh, and you can see that there has been a gradual reduction in recent decades uh, since Brainerd. Uh, okay, uh, what happened? Oh, I see that the word actually uh, did its auto replace of E of A to E in the viola pectinata. So we described two new species in the monograph. We uh, made three new combinations. We resurrected a bunch of old names because uh, they actually reflected our current concepts, even though many of them were synonyms or reduced to forms before or varieties. Uh, and there are a number of unnamed variants, uh, almost a dozen uh, in five species complexes that are under study. Okay, uh, at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to waltz through uh, the taxa. Um, and what I'll tell you uh, is what I tell my students. Let it wash over you. Don't attach anything to any specific details. I give you lots of details on the slides, but I'm going to ad lib and summarize the important information. And if you want a copy of the uh, slide presentation or a PDF of it. Uh, later, I'm happy to email it to you and then you can get into the weeds and read the details. Uh, but if I read the details, well, you can go to the monograph for that. And uh, we don't wanna be here for another hour. So green violet, very nondescript. I've actually often walked past populations of this before I realized I was walking past them. Uh, it's just this kind of stemmed, thing uh, that has little greenish white flowers, very distinctive. And the flowers uh, actually have the lower petal uh, only slightly longer than the lateral and upper ones. Pombalia parviflora, and, and it's the only native species in the genus Cubelium. Uh, and that genus is actually sister to the three species that now remain in Hypanthus down in Mexico and Central America and the West Indies. Pombalia parviflora is a very rare waif uh, in our region, uh, in Eastern North America, it's uh, been found a number of times in railroad ballast and heavy, uh, heavily disturbance uh, in, in certain areas. Uh, but it's Andean, strangely enough. Uh, it's a small uh, uh, herbaceous plant uh, with uh, very tiny white flowers and the bottom petal there, as you can see, is uh, much larger than the lateral and upper ones. Uh, the, I'm going to introduce the rest of the species uh, it, by their lineages, by the, by the groups that we've placed them to kind of give you a sense of how things are related now. Uh, so uh, the first section I'll introduce is, is, a, is the yellow and uh, flowered section, Chemi Melanium. It's the only diploid lineage in the Northern Hemisphere. Everything else is allotetraploid or, or high allopolyploid. Uh, they're perennial herbs. Almost all of them have erect or reclining stems. Uh, quite a lot of species distributed in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we have nine species in our region and, uh, and that, re uh, that represent four informal groups. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a bit more extensively allopolyploid in the West, and there are three groups that don't get over into our neck of the woods. Uh, but again, all of them have yellow flowers or white flowers with a yellow center. Uh, the Canadensis group is easily recognized. Uh, they have white petals with yellow centers. Uh, the two species differ uh, uh, in a number of uh, characters, one of which is whether the rhizome has a long stolon-like stolon extension. So Canadensis almost never has that. There are a few populations in the Southern Appalachians which do, which is completely anomalous. Uh, but otherwise are identical to canadensis. Rugulosa, however, has uh, very extensive stolon-like rhizomes and it forms mats. And uh, where I saw it in Wisconsin recently, uh, it was forming mats on top of boulders uh, in the woodland. Uh, the, uh, they also differ in uh, whether the, hair, the foliage is hairy or not and the shape of the leaves and to some extent the stipules. Uh, and to the yellow flowered, members. Uh, the Nudicollis is, is the larger group uh, comprising the strictly yellow flower 
different members. They all have stems, uh, erect or reclining. Areocarpa and pubescens have been confused for ever since they were described practically. Uh, and in our, our very intensive study of them, what we discovered was areocarpa is wildly variable. It can have one stem. Uh, it can have five to six stems. Uh, it can have uh, broader leaves. It can have, uh, well, uh, somewhat uh, narrower leaves, uh, but it differs in never having the dense, the fully dense pubescence that pubescence has. Uh, it almost all, well, it always has basal leaves, uh, and the the uh, the leaf bases are generally chordate. Uh, once in a great while, you'll find one that's truncate, but that's almost never. Uh, and the leaf margins have. Uh, no more than 15 teeth per side. Uh, pubescence, densely pubescent, just like its name, uh, generally one erect stem. Um, it rarely has a basal leaf. Uh, and the leaf bases tend to be truncate or more commonly even very broadly uh, tapering, very broadly cuneate. And leaf margins uh, you almost always have 16 to 22 teeth per side, although there are a few places in the Southern Appalachians and in uh, Wisconsin where I found as few as 13. So once you get those down, then you can't mistake them. And, and again, Areocarpa is extremely variable uh, and, and that's been the cause of the problem. Other species are really distinctive. Viola hastata has a uh, hastate leaves, basically arrowhead-shaped leaves with a, with a, 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 a chordate base. Uh, and then very often the upper surface will be silvery with a deep, uh, deep or dark green veins. Globarima, uh, very easy to identify. Uh, one erect stem, uh, rarely with a basal leaf or sometimes with a basal leaf, depending on where you're at. In uh, the base of the leaf is uh, narrowly tapering to rounded. So this is this makes it immediately distinct from Areocarpa. Tripartita, you can't mistake it for anything. It's always got three to five lobes. Uh, Nataliani it belongs to a different group, which is more Western, and is more diverse over there. And it just gets into Minnesota from the Great Plains. Uh, long, narrow leaves, uh, generally uh, covered with a fine grayish uh, pubescence, very distinctive. Uh, the rotundifolia has been classified as, an, as a stemless species, but if you see it in the summer and you look carefully, you will often find one or two or maybe even three prostrate stems, which don't root, so they're not true stolons, and it will have capsules, cleistogamous capsules. So it's really stemless in the spring and stemmed in the summer. And that's one of the few that does that in the whole section. Section Millennium, this is the pansies, uh, very diverse in, uh, in Eurasia. Uh, we only have one species in North America and it's actually native. Um, the, the pansies are primitively allotetraploid. Uh, the original diploid ancestors disappeared. Uh, and uh, and it, it goes all the way up to uh, uh, 14x. Uh, uh, many different species have multiple ploidy levels. And strangely enough, they can hybridize and the different ploidy levels can produce fertile seeds. Viola uh, uh, tricolor and other pansies have been involved in cultivation uh, and pansy breeding, which is a big uh, bedding plant industry, as you probably know or may know. Uh, so they have ascending multiple stems. The stipules are really, distinctive in being deeply dissected. And the tip of the stipule, the terminal lobe, looks like the leaf. Uh, and so the stipule form can actually guide you somewhat in identifying species. Uh, we have three who introduced, so Viola arvensis, usually cream flowered, uh, and the sepals are nearly as long as or even longer than the petals. Uh, Viola tricolor has a reverse condition where the petals are distinctly longer than the sepals, and it's usually variegated. Uh, and then Raffineschii uh, has the sepals uh, shorter than the petals, like tricolor, but the terminal stipule lobe is actually quite broad and it has very few, if any, teeth. Uh, viol uh, rostrate violets uh, and other uh, members of section viola. So section viola is restricted to uh, the, the old world, uh, although we get viola odorata as an escape. Uh, the new world, we get uh, viola, or we get the rostrati, which 
is found uh, throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's quite a large lineage, uh, 69 species uh, all over the Northern Hemisphere, uh, a bit of allopolyploidy species frequently hybridized, but uh, at least in North America, they're all sterile hybrids. Uh, I'll jump into the species. So Viola adunca is a northern or boreal species uh, that, uh, that's found throughout the Rocky Mountains, although strangely not in Mexico. And I've looked at all the Mexican, uh, many Mexican collections. Uh, uh, it's really easy to recognize because the whole plant is densely short hairy, so proberulent, uh, and has uh, narrowly ovate triangular leaves uh, and deeply divided stipules. Uh, Viola labradorica is the other next most common species. It's uh, all over Eastern North America and also goes up into the Yukon in Canada. Uh, it's essentially hairless except for a few scattered hairs on the upper leaf surfaces. The stipules are shallowly fringed uh, and they're much broader than, uh, than the nunca. And these two will hybridize occasionally. You'll see uh, weird, uh, huge plants that end up being hybrids. Uh, Viola rostrata, you can't mistake it. Big long spur. Pale violet with a, a that dark purple eye spot, very distinctive. Viola striata, also very distinctive in the rostrate violets. Uh, sometimes confused with Viola canadensis if people don't look for the uh, uh, for the absence of the yellow uh, yellow throat, which uh, is a is an identifier for Viola canadensis. Uh, this is a floodplain species and it's pretty weedy. Uh, you'll often find it growing in people's lawns and up along the trails. Uh, another species that doesn't seem to match the rest of the rostrati, two of them, uh, are mat forming because the in the other species, the stems are deciduous with every year. In Appalachiensis and Walteri, the stems persist, they become prostrate, and the next year they root at the nodes. And basically the whole plant becomes mat forming because of that. But they will produce ascending stems in the, uh, the next spring. Uh, Appalachiensis is mostly hairless, except for a few scattered hairs on the upper surface of the leaf blades. Uh, Viola walteri is closely related to Appalachiensis, but you can tell it apart immediately because the foliage is, again, densely fubarulent with minute short hairs all over the foliage. Uh, and it also uh, usually has the upper leaf surfaces silvery uh, and the, uh, the veins dark green or, or even red. Viola odorata uh, is in the section, uh, subsection Viola. It has uh, true stolons, but they're somewhat thick and they're greenish, uh, which separates it from some of the acolescent white stoloniferous violets relatively easily. Uh, Plagiostigma is another quite large lineage that uh, is distributed throughout the Northern Hemisphere and down into, into Northern Latin America. Uh, quite a bit of polyploidy uh, in the Eurasian taxa, uh, where there are five additional groups that we don't get in North America. Uh, generally speaking, most of our species are white flowered with small, uh, small white flowered uh, with greenish white throat. Uh, and then we also have a couple of uh, violet, pale violet or pale purple uh, species. Uh, most, almost all of our species have stolons. Uh, or at least uh, pale creeping rhizomes. Okay, so uh, subsection bilobate is, uh, is one of the stemmed groups from the old world, uh, especially Eastern Asia. Uh, and uh, Rob Noxy and I and others have uh, documented it for the first time in the Western Hemisphere this year, this last year. Uh, and it's also introduced in uh, Connecticut uh, in pots. Um, it's, it's the violet, that if you're in New York and you have visited New York Botanical Garden, it's one of the more common violets in the well-watered lawns. Uh, it has uh, small white flowers with a yellow spur and the bottom petal has extensive purple nectar guides, so very distinctive. Uh, the rest of the violets in section Plagio Sigma are stemless. So Patillaries is a group uh, that's very well represented in Europe, 62 species in Europe, and we have one native in, uh, in North America, circumpolar species. Uh, they have relatively elongate spurs, somewhat similar to the rostrate violets. Uh, they're, uh, at least in our neck of the woods, not stoloniferous, although there are some, a few that, that can produce stolons in the old world. Um, Viola salkirkii is our native. 
uh, has uh, ovate leaves, uh, uh, deeply corrugated base where the basal lobes will often overlap uh, in life, uh, very distinctive. And the flowers are violet with a distinctly elongate spur. And the petals are, are hairless inside. Uh, we have three introduced Asian violets. Inconspicua is pretty widely distributed. Uh, there's probably more of it than uh, for sure than collections indicate or iNaturalist uh, posts indicate right now. Uh, it has uh, deep purple flowers with, a, uh, with uh, lateral petals hairy inside. Uh, Japonica, uh, what has been collected in the past, there don't seem to be any uh, uh, current records except for one. Uh, and it has uh, pale violet flowers uh, with a somewhat longer spur than the others. Uh, David Warrior, uh, my colleague in New York, has been doing some special studies with an Asian uh, taxonomist, and they've concluded that probably uh, this is not Japonica, but a closely related species that's very similar to it called Viola prionantha. And I appreciate David's uh, continued persistence. After a few months, I gave up and settled on Japonica uh, because there was no reason at the moment to, to decide otherwise. Uh, Viola Petrinii has been reported uh, by name from North America before, but, uh, but the only true records that we have now are from Connecticut and New York. And then uh, if you go to the Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, which I haven't been, uh, and look along the sidewalks uh, and the, the abutments of the bridge, uh, it's growing there uh, as an introduction. Uh, uh, Two of the more distinctive species that belong to their own informal group um, are Viola palustris and Viola soasica. Viola soasica used to be called Viola phipsula until recently. And my colleague Thomas Markison and Jerry Danielka in Europe uh, have been studying the, the palustris violets there intensively and discovered that uh, there is Viola phipsula and then there's Viola soasica and we have uh, Viola soasica. Uh, and it's a little more complicated than that, but you don't really want to know. Uh, this is a, an, uh, a polyploid group. Uh, uh, Palustris is octoploid, allo-octoploid, uh, and Soasica is uh, tetraploid. Uh, they do hybridize occasionally and produce sterile triploid hybrids, uh, and they also hybridize with, uh, with minusculin uh, occasionally and produce uh, triploid hybrids over there. So it's a real mess uh, in, uh, up in the north and over in the west. Um, uh, three other species which are not quite so complicated, viola lanceolata, very distinctive with lanceolate leaf blades, uh, no more than six times as long as broad, uh, and generally hairless, I didn't mention that, uh, very widely distributed and apparently uh, introduced in cranberry bogs in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Primula lafolia is pretty widely distributed in the, uh, primarily in the coastal plain, but gets up into the mountains, strangely enough. Uh, and it has shorter, broader leaves, which are often truncate or even slightly chordate, and very often also hairy. Uh, and Viola vitata uh, used to be recognized as a variety or even just uh, sunk into lanceolata, but we pulled it out. It has uh, distinctive, very, very long uh, leaf blades, proportional leaf blades. Uh, it is sometimes hairy, sometimes not. The leaf teeth are slightly different from lanceolata and it's, uh, it's found along the Atlantic and Gulf Coastal Plain and just gets up into New Jersey. Minuscula uh, has hairless leaves, uh, strictly hairless leaves, although the leaf stalks can be hairy sometimes. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a species of very wet sites. So bog mats, sedge meadows, uh, other very open uh, wet sites, sometimes in potholes right next to other species. Uh, it will hybridize with other uh, members of the, its group. Uh, and again, they're, they're generally sterile. Viola renifolia is the only species that doesn't produce stolons. It's strictly a non-stoloniferous. If you find a species that, or find a plant that has stolons, it has a leaf shape of renifolia, you've got a hybrid with probably Viola incognita. Uh, so, uh, uh, and it's found, uh, it's generally a boreal species uh, and gets up into the, the central and northern Rocky Mountains. Uh, the Blandy group, to uh, octoploid species, uh, what we think we've found is that uh, uh, in our in our phylogenetic work, uh, it shares a minuscule genome and a genome from the ancestor of the lanceolata primulifolia group. 
Uh, and I have a graduate student who's going to be starting to study that. Um, they're, they have been confused and they're still somewhat tricky, uh, but generally speaking, uh, Blanda has narrowly ovate leaves that are uh, that have scattered hairs on the upper leaf surfaces. Uh, generally, the flowers and the leaf stalks are purple or red, uh, and the lateral petals are hairless inside. The seed also differs uh, from incognita. Incognita is more widely distributed. It's hairy or hairless, uh, but the foliage and the flower stalks are green, and the lateral petals have hairs inside. Finally, uh, the succinosphinium, uh, what almost nobody has been waiting for, probably. Uh, this has been a real mess. Uh, it took a lot to delineate this from other groups around the world, and we finally managed to do it by using 10 or 15 characters. Uh, it's an it starts as an allodecoploid lineage with five distinct genomes uh, and includes uh, multiple sublineages. Perennial herbs, four groups are stemless, two are stemmed. Uh, 62 species, so pretty, pretty diverse, uh, scattered throughout uh, North America and into, uh, uh, into northeastern Japan and Siberia and the Hawaiian Islands, Mexico and Central America, uh, uh, based on the Mexicani. Uh, one of uh, uh, six subsections and two in our region, including acolescent blues and a viola pedata. And if you want to see the others, you have to go to Hawaii or the Western US or down into Mexico and Central America. So the pedati has been placed with the acolescent blues in the past, but it differs by uh, several important features. Uh, the rhizome is different. The stipules are very long adnate or attached to the leaf stalks. Petals have no hairs within, uh, and it's only chasmogamous. Uh, it's a single species in its own subsection, quite distinct. Uh, two, uh, we've recognized three species in Eastern North America, two of them in our, our region, the widely distributed pedata, which can have uh, bicolorous flowers or uh, concolorous uniformly uh, pale blue flowers. Um, and it has uh, what we call pedately divided leaves. What that means is that the central primary division is not lobed and the lateral divisions are lobed once again. So it looks like, looks like a bird's foot, generally speaking, which is why would they, one of the common names is bird's foot violet. Uh, but the subspecies Cuneata loba is different. Its leaf blades have the primary and central and lateral divisions, but each division is actually dissected into five or more, more short linear segments. So it actually, uh, reminds me of a dicentra, squirrel corner, Dutchman's breeches. And it's found almost strictly in the shale barrens region. Uh, subsection Borealli uh, is, is the rest of uh, the violets, the acolycent uh, blue violets in our region. Uh, stemless, uh, lateral petals are hairy inside, and the spurred petal uh, can also be hairy, depending on the species. Uh, they're both chasmogamous and cleistogamous. There are 42 species uh, in North America and, and Mexico, uh, and uh, in nine informal groups that we've delineated morphologically and ecologically, 31 species in our region. This is the group that, uh, that uh, expresses the greatest amount of hybridization. Not everything is a hybrid, uh, but uh, if you're in a group, uh, in an area where there's ecological diversity, so different kinds of microhabitats, and you have multiple uh, acolescent blue violet species in the area, get on your hands and knees. I mean, literally get on your hands and knees and start looking for hybrids because if there's an ecotone or there's an, an, a disturbance like a trail, or a dig dug up area, you're likely to find hybrids. And those hybrids, as Brainerd pointed out, and we've confirmed, will often express Mendelian segregation of the parental traits. So you will find not only F1s that are perfectly intermediate, but all manner, depending on the extent of intermediate habitat, all manner of combinations of traits of the parental species. They will only ever represent two parental species, however, because remember, those hybrids can only reproduce by cleistogamy, those self-pollinating capsules. There is no gene flow involving three or more species. It can't happen. Uh, so there's considerable regional endemism in this group. Uh, and, uh, and every species that we've identified as such so far expresses a distinctive microhabitat relative to the others. Uh, I'm going to uh, waltz quickly through the group. 
uh, and touch briefly on the species because I know we're running out of time probably and I talk a lot. Uh, so the Aphinus group uh, uh, is an informal group that has uh, mostly triangular ovate, narrowly triangular ovate leaves in the spring, although those leaves can, uh, can usually broaden to uh, to, to become kite-like or deltate later. Sepals in most species are acute. Uh, they have, uh, in most species, a uh, spotted Cleistogonus capsule and they're bottomland forest or swamp species. Uh, there are six species, three of them in our region, the rest are in southeastern United States. Uh, Aphnus, uh, spurred petal is hairy. Uh, if it's in flower, you can easily identify it as that. Uh, imposter, uh, and uh, Missouriensis, the spurred petal is hairless inside. Uh, an imposter, uh, 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 something that we're going to describe uh, in the next few months, uh, Rimberwell and I, uh, is, a, is a newly detected species along the lower Atlantic coastal plain. Uh, and it has very elongate uh, oracles uh, and uh, is distinct in the number of features from other members of the group. Missouriensis is widely distributed in, uh, in the Midwest, uh, has rounded sepals and they're usually ciliolate, so very short cilia along the margins, oracles are short uh, and, uh, and you have it there. Uh, Cuculata group, uh, this includes six species. Uh, so in this group, the leaf blades are generally ovate to uh, reniform or kidney shaped. The sepals are also in most cases sharply acute, uh, except in nephropola. Uh, and these are of open wetlands, sometimes of uh, floodplains, but generally open habitats. Viola communis uh, has been called Viola papillionacea uh, for a long time, although Ezra Brainerd and others lumped other things into papillionacea too. Uh, it, uh, uh, communis has shiny, uh, shiny uh, upper and lower leaf surfaces uh, and uh, generally rounded uh, leaf tips uh, and the spurred petal is hairless. Uh, Viola pratincola, uh, we've, uh, we've followed Russell and uh, resurrected it. Uh, it has more narrowly ovate spring leaves that broaden in the summer. They're not shiny. Uh, sepals are uh, narrowly acute and the spurred petal is usually sparsely hairy and it has uh, uh, seeds similar to communis. Retusa is another species. Ezra Brainerd uh, mentioned Green's Retusa in one of his publications uh, early on and then never mentioned it again. Uh, it's as though he forgot it, uh, but we've resurrected it. It's, a, it's almost strictly a Great Plains species with a, a few disjunct populations in Eastern Minnesota. And the petals are often uh, uh, notched or retuse. Cuculata, very distinctive. The flowers are held above the leaves. The petals pale are pale violet with a dark eye spot, uh, reminiscent of rostrata. Uh, and the, the lateral petal hairs, people get hung up on it. The lateral petal, petal hairs are clavate, broadly clavate, which means not just club shaped, but some of them are doorknob shaped. And the hairs are so short that they expose the throat of the violet flower in life. So if you're looking at a flower and you think it's cuculata, you should see right into its innards uh, because the hairs are so short. All the other species that have clavate hairs have much longer hairs that obscure the throat. So that's an easy character. Domestica, I'm not even sure if this really escapes cultivation. It looks like a product of plant breeding, uh, but I can't be sure. Uh, it's been found in a number of areas, but almost always in gardens or areas that used to be gardens. Uh, looks vaguely like communis, but the leaf blades are pointed and the margins are more prominent. Nephrophila, uh, a calcophile, very strong calcophile, loves fens, uh, limestone pavement, uh, limestone uh, uh, riverbanks. Uh, leaf blades are broad and rounded, sepals are rounded, and the spurred petal is empty hairy. Uh, the Soraya group has a number of species. Uh, generally speaking, the foliage is almost always hairy, or at least with distinct large hairs on the upper surface. Leaf blades are undivided, triangular to kidney shaped. Sepals are, in most species, are obtuse to rounded uh, and ciliate and the Cleistogamous capsules are spotted. These are two species that used to belong under Novi Anglii, uh, but we've studied them and determined that there are enough characters to, uh, to warrant separation as, uh, as species. Uh, Grizzia is uh, more or less densely hairy throughout. Leaf blades are, are uh, uh, narrowly triangular in both of them. Sepals are hairy, they're, uh, they're rounded in both species, but they're ciliate and grizzia. Uh, 
in both species, this bird petal is densely hairy. Uh, Grizzia usually occupies acidic uh, substrates or sometimes circumneutral lake shores, uh, whereas Novi anguii occupies limestone uh, rock substrates. Whether that's an accident of where they are found or not, I'm still not sure. Hirsutula, one of the most distinctive species in the whole group. Uh, the foliage has uh, the upper surface of the leaves silvery and the veins are dark green or sometimes uh, red purple. Uh, I've seen hybrids with viola palmata and they're pretty spectacular. Somebody ought to put that into cultivation if they haven't done it already. Uh, viola latiuscula is a mystery. Uh, it's a it's a regional endemic. Uh, it was described uh, by Green and and uh, highlighted by Brainerd as in the Northeast, and basically was ignored ever since Brainerd's time. Uh, but it uh, but it is distinctive. Uh, foliage is hairless. Uh, the leaves start out uh, triangular and then they broaden up to two or sometimes even slightly more times as long as broad. Really crazy. Uh, kite-like things. Uh, sepals are acute, their spurred petal is densely hairy. So the traits really don't match anything else. And the seeds are strangely uh, dark purple. Potentiary analysis, uh, I lumped this in with Sororia a long time ago, and ever since I've realized my mistake. Uh, Subtentry analysis, pretty widespread in uh, the Northeast and uh, somewhat in the Appalachians and then in the Western Rocky Mountains and uh, Canada. So densely hairy like uh, Viola sororia, uh, but uh, the, the cilia on the leaf, on the leaves and on the sepals are longer than sororia and the sepals have cilia all the way to the tips uh, and the spurred petal is densely hairy. Its seeds are different from sororia as well. Uh, I've uh, found a, a, a Midwest variant of this uh, that seems to be more consistently hairy uh, and uh, has more consistent sepal shape. Uh, the seeds are shorter than septentry analysis and they have minute raised black spots. Uh, we need to do more studies to determine what this is. Uh, Sororia, in the narrow sense, is pretty much always densely hairy, um, uh, has green foliage, uh, leaf blades have short cilia on the margins, uh, and then prominent, uh, prominent teeth, uh, sepals are rounded and cilia only to the middle. Uh, and spurred petal is hairless. Two variants, we're still trying to tease these out and figure out if they're distinct enough. Uh, one is basically like Sororia, except the margins are more shallowly scalloped uh, and the foliage is completely hairless. Uh, in the seeds that we've looked at, they tend to be paler uh, and not quite as uh, heavily modeled. Uh, the Hirsuchaloides variant is a bit different. Uh, it's got more silvery gray foliage uh, and the on the upper surface of the leaves, the, the mid vein is, is faintly reddish purple uh, and the margins are more prominently scalloped or crenate. Uh, Peditifida group, uh, uh, this includes uh, Bertoniana on the Atlantic coast and then uh, Peditifida in the Midwest prairies. These all have uh, biternate uh, leaf blades and uh, they differ in subtle but, but multiple characteristics. Uh, Pectinata used to be called a leaf form of Bertoniana, but we've found that at least in the Southern states, it occupies a distinct microhabitat and produces uh, uh, uniform populations all by itself. Uh, and so we've retained it. Uh, in the subsinuated group, uh, we have uh, four species in our region, another one further South. Um, Viola Baxteri is an Eastern Great Lakes endemic. Uh, uh, and subsinuata is more widely distributed in, uh, in the ap higher uh, Appalachian mountain region. Uh, and they differ in a number of characteristics, uh, particularly in seeds. Uh, the seeds of Baxter eye are pale and uh, with or without very weak spots. And subsinuata always has uh, more, uh, more obviously uh, gray-brown seeds with noticeable dark blotches. Monaconora. Uh, and tenuous secta are new species that we described in the monograph, uh, thanks to the great work of two graduate students, Bethany Zumaldi for tenuous secta and Jen Hastings for Monaconora. Uh, Monaconora is biternate uh, and has uh, angled or falcate lobes. Uh, it's almost endemic to the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, and uh, it has sharply acute sepals uh, and uh, the foliage is basically hairless and the sepals are basically not cilia. Tenuous secta um, 
Uh, I was shown this by uh, Tom, Johnny Townsend and Tom Weebold in 2012 and realized that it was a new species when they took me to their Viola pedatifida in the Shell Barrens. Um, it grows uh, in uh, forested areas uh, around the margins of Shell Barrens openings or in glades, uh, lightly forested areas near, uh, near within the openings. Uh, it's unique in being tetraternately dissected in the summer with leaves practically doily like uh, very, uh, very cool species uh, on three small parallel mountain ranges. Uh, we've got about 12 to 13 sites now, but it seems to be not fantastically rare within that uh, narrow world range. The Edulix group, uh, this is a more southeastern coastal plain group. Uh, we've got one species along the Atlantic coast. So if you've got uh, a species that looks like Viola palmata with undivided early spring and late fall leaves uh, and, and uh, three to five lobes uh, and it's hairless, then you've got Viola edulis. Uh, Viola viarum and Viola agostonii uh, belong to a group of three species. The other one is in New Mexico and, uh, and Texas in the Guadalupe Mountains. All three uh, are restricted to limestone in some way. Uh, Viola agostonii and, and viarum differ in a number of uh, characteristics, uh, some subtle, uh, a few not so much. Uh, then there's the Third uh, thing in our region, a variant of, that I've placed with Eggostonii, but it could just as well be with Viarum. It doesn't, it, it shares features of both species and then also has very short lateral petal hairs, which is distinctive. Uh, and we can't quite place what it is. Uh, and it seems to be the same thing that's been introduced to Austria and Korea. Uh, uh, a colleague in Austria has been sending me pictures and, it, and it's identical to this Canadian mystery plant. Uh, Palmeda, uh, a widespread group, uh, occupies usually drier uh, forests, uh, mesic ones in terms of uh, Vilastoniana. So uh, uh, ped again, pedately divided where the, uh, uh, in some cases at least, where the central lobe is undivided. In others, uh, the, the central lobe uh, can be uh, divided again, like the lateral ones. Uh, in most cases, in most species, they're hairless or they're hairy, very densely hairy. Uh, in others, they're not. The sepals are usually ciliate and obtuse. Um, there are a number of variants in the Viola palmata complex, uh, the Avapes variant, uh, we only know from field work from two localities in Virginia so far, has distinctive seed pattern and also a dissection pattern of the leaves. Uh, Pseudostoniana is more widely distributed. It's actually biternate, although you can't tell it from the picture here. Uh, and typical palmata is not. Uh, and Stoniana is a bit different. It's almost hairless. Uh, leaf blades are deeply biternately divided. Sepals are acute rather than obtuse and they're not ciliate. And the seeds are pale. Uh, Sagittata group, uh, we've got three species, uh, or rather four species in our region. Uh, these mostly occupy drier environments, uh, often drier forests or dry sand prairies. Uh, Emarginata used to be sunk in Viola Sagittata, but it has uh, noticeable wings on the leaf stalks, and the, the leaves are usually erect uh, later in flower and in fruit. Uh, that's, uh, uh, there are a number of variants in the Emarginata, the Kentucky variant, which has rarely narrowly winged petioles, um, and the petals are not notched as they are in typical Emarginata. Uh, and then two weirdo leaf variants, Phasmatifolia and Xiphophila, uh, as Matifolia leaves look like a stick insect. Uh, and that's, you know, it's very distinctive. Xiphophila looks like a long sword with a, with a couple of uh, lobes, one or a couple of lobes at the very base. Uh, uh, and that's found in one place in Virginia and uh, one place in North Carolina. And I believe I've heard that there's a South Carolina uh, site just across the state border. Uh, Viola fimbriatula, often confused with Sagittata, but they differ in a number of features. The habit, uh, the outer leaves are prostrate like a primrose uh, rosette. Uh, it's uh, essentially always densely hairy, the, including the leaf and flower stalks. The sepals are ciliate. Uh, Sagittata is wildly variable, can be hairless, can be minutely hairy, uh, uh, but the leaves are always ascending, 
uh, and the leaf stalks get longer than the leaves, which is not the case in Fimbriatula. Uh, sepals are typically not cilia either, and the habitats are somewhat different. Septum loba, uh, southeastern coastal plain species that just barely gets into southeastern Virginia. Foliage is somewhat succulent uh, and has longer lobes uh, than, uh, than Viola sagittata or marginata. And huge flowers. Flowers are about twice the size of the others. Uh, there are a handful of uh, potentials uh, that are within one, uh, one to three counties of our region. Uh, Pombalia verticillata is a Great Plains and Southwest species that's uh, right next to Missouri, and maybe some lucky person will find it. It's a stem species with very narrow leaves and uh, tiny yellow and purple flowers. Viola adenchoides looks a lot like adunca. Uh, the leaves are broader and uh, more rounded, and it's tetraploid. Viola marginata, a lower Midwest variant, uh, is, is found in a number of places in Southern Missouri that, of course, are actually cut out of the manual range. Uh, so it might show up in uh, northern Missouri or elsewhere. Viola langlawisii, similarly, we've confirmed populations in the boot heel of Missouri uh, and in adjacent Arkansas, and it might someday be found in, in Missouri uh, or even possibly um, Kentucky. And then finally, Viola valicola, uh, related to Viola natalii, is a Great Plains and Southwest species, and it grows literally right next to western Missouri. Uh, a lot of people have helped, and honestly, uh, I couldn't have done this without standing on the shoulders of so many people. Uh, I, I want to thank especially Carolyn Copenheaver and Kathleen Howlinsworth for working me through the process of uh, getting this gigantic manuscript put together and then actually cleaned up over and over and over. Uh, there were, have been many botanists, many fine taxonomists that I've consulted and, and uh, interacted with over taxonomic issues and ideas, and also people who led me on um, important uh, investigations that changed things taxonomically for me. I've had some wonderful graduate students and still have some wonderful graduate students and uh, and lots of undergrads to help me in this work. Uh, lots of herbaria have been visited, but in particular, uh, uh, Carnegie Museum, Field Museum, and the rest, and especially Missouri and New York Botanical Garden, who have been putting up with me for decades, visiting over and over again when I probably should have gotten it right in the first place. Uh, lots of people have contributed uh, images for the monograph and, and for the website that, uh, that it's based on, uh, but in particular, Kim Blaxland, now deceased, Katie Ch uh, Chaka, Peter Dzuk, uh, Andrew Lane, Arthur Haynes, and Bruce Sori uh, contributed a lot of images. Uh, funding from Virginia Native Plant Society twice, uh, and repeated funding from Ohio University and then other organizations to support my work and that of my students. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, shout out for uh, my husband, Andrew Stewart, who has never uh, refused to go in the field or in the herbarium with me to help me with all of the crazy work that I do. So thank you for everything. And if anybody has questions, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you so much. That was a lovely talk. And just for me personally, I love seeing all the pictures uh, of the different species. Um, for folks who would like to ask a question, please do use the raise hand feature. On my Zoom, it's in like reactions and then raise hand. It might be slightly different on your Zoom. Uh, but we do have a great question in the chat to start with from Andy Zimmerman. Why have violets evolved into so many species? Oh, that's a hard question. Well, it's a it's a fairly old genus. Uh, the family looks to be 50 million years old. The the genus viola looks to be you know uh, 15 million years old and has had a lot of opportunity for. Uh, for uh, species development. And then allopolyploidy has contributed a huge amount to new combinations of the original ancestral genes. So uh, I think that's one, one explanation. Also, um, a lot of herbaceous lineages have evolved from the woody ones and those herbaceous lineages uh, are reproducing uh, with uh, fruits close to the ground. The seeds don't disperse as far and there's greater, generally speaking, greater differentiation in, in those kinds of evolutionary situations. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Great. It looks like we have a question uh, from Daniel. I'm just gonna ask them to unmute. Uh, let me see if they...
is this about the sepals? Oh. Oh yeah, it looks like they did write it in the chat. Daniel, if you want to unmute and read it, you can go ahead, or I can read it. Read it out. Yeah, let's see here. Yeah. So, so technically speaking, you're right. Um, uh, but I pretend that the flowers are not resupinate. So, so what? It, it's a weird morphological thing where the violet flowers uh, are produced on the on the flower stalk, and then they actually invert. So when I'm saying spurred petal, I'm kind of hedging my bet, and it and it it it's, appears to be the bottom petal, but in fact actually is the top petal morphologically. But we're not going to go there. So the lowest sepals, uh, uh, when I say lowest sepals, they're the ones on, on either side of the spurred petal or the bottom petal. If that makes any sense. Great. Uh, do we have any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand or- I think everybody okay, went we home. <laughs> Robbie? Oh no, everybody's still here. Here we go, Robbie, if you want to unmute and go ahead. Hello, uh, great talk. Uh, and I just had a quick question. So you mentioned that earlier that hybridization is almost uh, absent outside of uh, Viola. So I was curious why from an evolutionary standpoint is hybridization absent outside of Viola? Uh, those lineages are potentially considerably older. Uh, and so they have had a, a, probably a, a longer time to differentiate the, the handful of places where there might be hybrids. Uh, and, and that's a big if our, uh, our groups that are more, maybe more recently evolved and also have uh, polyploidy, uh, quite a bit of polyploidy. So one of the places where you actually see quite a bit of hybrids is in a group a genus called Melocytus in Australia and New Zealand. And those things are pretty high polyploids. And so they seem to hybridize and they're genetically compatible because they're all sharing so many genomes. Uh, so that's, I think, in part, uh, the story. We have Robert raising their hand. Yes, hi, Harvey. Hi, um, Robert. Hi, great presentation. Is there a physiological or a genetic reason why the Hybrids are so freely fertile with the Cleistogamous flowers, but not with um, the Chasmogamous, Chasmogamous ones? I'm not sure how to explain the absence of Chasmogamous reproduction in the Borrelia americani, but what I think is happening in the Cleistogamous ones is that um, the, the, the suction cami millennium appears to be a progenitor for practically all of the other Northern Hemisphere lineages including the stemless whites that were the second progenitor and the rostrate violets, which are the third progenitor of the acolescent blues. And so there in the acolescent blues, you have basically three genomes that are quite similar because they originated from the same ancient lineage and then two others that differentiated later. So I have a feeling that the reason that they can form fertile or at least subfertile hybrids is because there's a lot of there are a lot of genes that are in common, and so the the uh, the organisms are more genetically compatible. Why there's an absence of chasmogamous reproduction, mm -hmm. I have no idea. But that mm -hmm. would be a really interesting phenomenon to investigate. But Brainerd looked at thousands of plants over the course of twenty years and apparently never found one. Mm -hmm. um, now at some point. I think that in after many generations, those you know some of those hybrids could have become genetically fertile, could have become more fully complementary, and then produced chasmogamous flowers again. Uh, that's a possibility, because something must have happened. Thank you. Sorry, unsatisfying, but <laughs> nobody really knows. <laughs> we can make stories up as biologists, right? It right. looks like we have a follow-up question from Daniel in the chat. How hairy does a spurred petal have to be to be considered bearded? <laughs> Are there sometimes few hairs on the spurred petal of otherwise beardless species? Yes, and unfortunately it's true. So when I'm saying densely bearded, I mean uh, 20 to 40 or 50 hairs. Uh, sparsely bearded might be 
five to 10. <laughs> I've never counted, but I've actually looked at lots of them. Uh, in Sororia and Communis, and uh, not usually Cuculia, but Sororia, uh, occasionally uh, Communis and other species with uh, hairless bird petals, uh, you will sometimes see a few hairs, as in one to four or five. If you see more than that, look at other traits because it's very likely that you're looking at a hybrid involving something like Viola aphanus or Viola sagittata or Viola uh, hirsutula uh, with a bearded spurred petal. And, and hybrids are not uncommon. In fact, in our, at our university, we have a lawn and Viola communis is just all over the place in the lawn. But in certain areas that are wetter, Viola aphanus was probably around and it's certainly in the floodplain uh, that runs through the campus and in some places under downspouts next to the buildings, I find hybrids of communis with aphanus and mm -hmm. the leaves are more narrow and they're more pointed. They're still shiny from the communis, but they've got a sparsely bearded bottom petal and the capsules aren't quite right and the seeds show aphanus characteristics. So if you find a weird plant and it's got more than a couple of hairs when it shouldn't have them, then you know, assume hybrids and then look for confirmation. Another question about species ID, maybe hybrids um, from Tina Vales, excuse me if I pronounced that incorrectly, but how significant is flower color for ID? The photo of Viola lanceolata was a white violet, but I recently saw one with similar leaves and a lavender flower. Uh, the acolescent whites, well, where are they from? I should ask where they're from. <laughs> mm, that's a good question. Can you drop in the chat where you, where'd you see the flower? New Hampshire. In the Mike Mountains? So Viola palustris is in the White Mountains and they might've seen uh, uh, white uh, Viola uh, palustris and possibly viola minuscula and hybrids. Hmm. So that would cool. explain it. So for our last question, I really like to ask as the last question, like if you had one takeaway that you wanted the folks here to walk away from this talk with, what would it be? Don't assume that everything that looks violet is one species. <laughs> Assume that you might have multiple species growing in your lawn or in your area. And also the, the, the corollary to that is if you want to see violet diversity, visit different habitats. The greater the habitat diversity, the greater diversity of violets because they're intimately tied ecologically to their environment. Well, thank you so much for the talk. And again, uh, we did do a recording, so this will be available. Um, on our YouTube channel, if anyone missed any of it. Uh, and thank you so much. Thank you, Harvey, for being here. Thank you. I apologize for going too long. Well, that was great.